Hello. Happy Sunday. And uh, I'm carrying on with The Artist's Way. That's written by Julia Cameron. And um, I can't remember everything that was previously, but I do remember making several other videos, posting some, then deleting them, and then making others and not posting them. Uh, <laughs> anyway, so with all that back and forth, uh, which I know is useless information, but um, I'm, this is my attempt. I'm just going to try and just do it all one shot. Read through, make this video, post it straight away, and not hesitate. Okie dokie. <laughs> but thank you for your patience and... Uh, yeah. Okay, success. Creativity is a spiritual practice. It is not something that can be perfected, finished, and set aside. It is my experience that we reach plateaus of creative attainment only to have a certain re restlessness set in. Yes, we are successful. Yes, we have made it, but... Da, da, da. In other words, just when we get there, there disappears. Dissatisfied with our accomplishments, however lofty, we are once again confronted with our creative self and its hungers. The questions we have just laid to rest now rear their heads again. What are we going to do now? This unfinished quality, this, this restless appetite for further exploration, tests us. We are asked to expand in order that we not contract. Evading this commitment and evasion that tempts us all leads straight into stagnation, discontent, spiritual discomfort. Can't I rest? We wonder. In a word, the answer is no. As artists, we are spiritual Shocks. The ruthless truth is that if we don't keep moving, we sink to the bottom and die. The choice is very simple. We can insist on resting on our laurels or we can begin anew. The stringent requirement of a sustained creative life is the humility to start again, to begin anew. It is this willingness to once more be a beginner that distinguishes a creative career. A friend of mine, a master in his field, finds himself uncomfortably committed years in advance of his avail availability. He is in an enviable, enviable position on a business level, but he finds it increasingly perilous to his autistic health. When the wheel... Uh, that... Um, I don't know who got it first, but... First, but I've been seeing it quite a lot lately, that... Um, and I'm not going to try and like explain it afterwards, but you can go, you can think on it by yourself, but like the whole thing, um, that health is wealth, um, or some kind of combination. I mean, you just throw it into the blender of where, whatever social or non-social, whatever it is. But if I just, I like that because it, it's like. Okay, I, I know I just went a little bit away, but I was just thinking, I was trying to figure out how long it would take me to go off on a tangent, and now I'm deciding not to. But anyway, it's like health as in, okay, perhaps making the better um, choices for yourselves that can help you live in a better quality or it can help you feel better and that your mind work your mind works better that you can uh, be more present in life and uh, you can perhaps see life in the ways that are experienced by you in a better way in in a way that it's more qualitative than quantitative and therefore 
and maybe even a combination of both and both then being superseded by something that is almost of a rare quality that is like of the caliber of wealth or um, or like things like that you can't pay for it's so expensive that kind of thing that kind of and that makes me think that if you if you if you see to the things that you've got to be responsible for as a human being and and you seek God and you Matthew six thirty three and seek the kingdom first and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. And it's like and there are a couple of instructions and it's like if you also just keep in memory um, God is good and you can even start declaring that and then when you think of like that how God is always there he's watching he's protecting you when you pray to him he hears you he might not answer you the way you want it to be answered but that's not necessarily a bad thing um, he will surprise you and sometimes maybe you're going through a bit of a period of transition and change and and you can't really you can't really decide and you can't really detect and you're not too sure um, if you yourself as a person are, are you a good person who are you are you a bad person where are you going is that good was it good you know and um, or maybe feeling opposite a lot of lots of things are running around but if you can sort of take a step and recognize that your feet are on the ground, take a breath and give a moment to yourself in that moment or just to give your mind just sort of like that, just a little gap to appreciate that God's got this, God's got you. His thoughts are above our thoughts. So if I think that then if, if you understand that God is good, and if you pray to him and invite him in your situation and say, God, please guide me. I'm not sure how to do this, but I'm stepping back. I'm on my two feet and my focus, I want to make my focus on you. You are always good. Teach me in your ways. You know, I want to be a better person. I want to get that wealth, which is almost like stepping like from grace to grace. Like being so close to God and that and being like such a faithful person and such a faithful open vessel that God's anointing can flow through you and all you want is God and that you give him the glory and that you praise him for it and that you spread the good news then and and I think health can sometimes be a gift and what does wealth mean really it's I mean but yeah, those two things together, um, yeah, it's like, it just, yeah, it just makes me think, today I'll stop meandering, I'm sorry. Well, I, I'm sorry if I annoyed you, but I'm not sorry for saying a couple of things that I do believe in and maybe that was helpful to you. Um, and I suppose I should just mention that this whole thing, a portion of it, is me practicing, me processing, and uh, yeah, so, thank you, okay. The stringent requirement of a sustained creative life is the humility to start again, to begin anew. It is the Sorry. <laughs> is it, it is the willingness to once more be a beginner that distinguishes a creative career. A friend of mine, sorry, a master of the, his field, finds himself uncomfortably committed years in advance of his avail availability. He is, an envi he is in an enviable position on a business level, but he finds it increasingly perilous to his artistic health. When the wheel turns and the project committed to three years ago must be executed, can he do it with imagination and his initial enthusiasm? 
the honest answer is often an uncomfortable no. And so at a great financial cost, he has begun cutting back his future commitments, investing in the riskier but more rewarding gain of artistic integrity. Lacquer. A quote by Edward Hopper. No amount of skillful invention can replace the essential element of imagination. Mm. Yep. Imagination, explore, those two words, I like those. Faithfulness, probably another word for 2024. Um, supernatural, maybe as well, okay. <laughs> Not all of us always can, can muster such creative courage in the face of fiscal temptation, but we can try. Amen for that. We can at least be willing as artists, we are travelers, too heavily encumbered by our worldly dignity, too invested in our stations and positions. We are unable to yield our spiritual leadings. We insist on a straight and narrow when the artist's way is a spiral path. Invested in our outer tappings of a career, we can place that investment above our inner guidance. Deciding to play by the numbers, we lose our commitment to counting ourselves and our goals, our own goals, worthy. Creativity is not a business. Although it may generate, let's rewind, creativity is not a business, although it may generate much business. An artist cannot re replicate a prior success indefinitely. Those who attempt to work too long with formula, even their own formula, eventually leech themselves of their creative truths. Embedded as we often are in the business milieu of our art, it is tempting to guarantee what we cannot deliver. Good work that duplicates the good work that has gone before. Hey, that sounds like the beginning of misery. <laughs> Why do I say that? Well, maybe it's linked to something that I've experienced before, so I could very much probably possibly be wrong <laughs> okay um successful movies generate a business demand for sequels successful books <laughs> generate a demand for further similar books painters pass through popular periods in their work and may be urged to linger there for potters composers choreographers the problem is the same as artists we are asked to repeat ourselves and expand on the market we have built. Sometimes this is possible for us, other times it's not. As a successful artist, the trick is to not mortgage the future too heavily. If the house on the Hamptons cost two years of creative misery cranking out a promised project just for cash, that house is an expensive luxury. This is not to say that editors should stop planning seasons or that studios should scuttle their business bottom line. It is to say that many creatives laboring in fiscal settings should remember to commit themselves not only to projects that smack of the sure thing, but also to their riskier projects that call to their creative souls. You don't need to overturn a successful career in order to find creative fulfillment. It is necessary to overturn each day's schedule slightly to allow for those small adjustments in daily trajectory that over the long haul alter the course and the satisfactions of our careers. A quote by Juan Gri. You are lost the instant you know what the result will be. This means writing your morning pages, taking your artist date. But I run a studio, you say, or whatever thing it is you must do. People depend on me, I say, all the more reason to depend on yourself and protect your own creativity. If we ignore our inner commitment, the cost rapidly becomes apparent in the outer world. Bing, bing. A certain lackluster tone, a rote inevitability, evicts creative excitement from our lives and eventually our finances. Attempting to ensure our finances by playing it safe, we lose our cutting edge. As the promised projects diverge further and further from our inner leanings, a certain deep artistic wariness 
sits in. Mm. We must summon our enthusiasm at gunpoint instead of reveling in each day's creative task. Yeah, I mean, it, that makes sense. Artists can and do responsibly meet the demands of their business partnerships. What is more difficult and more critical is for us as artists to continue to meet the inner demand of our own artistic growth. In short, as success comes to us, we must be vigilant. <laughs> Any success postulated on a permanent artistic plateau dooms us and it to failure. Oh, okay. <clears throat> Okay, so that was success, and I think, um, I think I'll carry on reading, but cheers, um, hmm. okay, the next section, the zen of sports, I really like that, okay. Most blocked creatives are cerebral beings. We think of all the things we want to do but can't. Early in re recovery, we next think of all the things we want to do but don't. In order to affect a real recovery, one that lasts, we need to move out of the head and into a body of work. To do this, we must first of all move into the body. Again, this is a matter that requires acceptance. Creativity requires action, and part of that action must be physical. It is one of the pitfalls of Westerners adopting Eastern meditation techniques to bliss out and render ourselves high but d dysfunctional. We lose our grounding and without our capacity to act in the world. In the pursuit of higher consciousness, we render ourselves unconscious in a new way. Exercise combats this spiritually induced dysfunction. Shout out to John Verveke. Um, okay, from um, Roger Bannister on Breaking the Four Minute Mile. Quote No longer conscious of my movement, I discovered a new unity with nature. I had found a new source of power and beauty, a source I never dreamt existed. Oh, man. Getting into just oof. you're running and you're you you're like tapped in you just like you get in sync in rhythm and whatever the case may be with God like that God flow hmm? that consciousness stream tap in just a little bit um, oh man when you you push past the you like in the zone but. You, but then you're a little bit more and it's like something else this quote is so good I mean it's beautiful it really is beautiful I mean if you think of being being at unity with something that is way bigger than you and ultimately beautiful creative for example nature so no longer conscious of my movement. I discovered a new unity with nature. I had found a new source of power and beauty, a source I never dreamt existed. So, uh, so Roger Bannister on, the, on breaking the four-minute mile. So um, you can go look up the four-minute mile, um, and then you can just type in Roger Bannister, um, or either or, but um, you read up on that. Uh, but uh, he's a runner, so um, the movement he's he's talking about there is is running. And uh, yeah, returning to the notion of ourselves as spiritual radio sets, we need enough energy to raise a strong signal. Lacquer. This is where walking comes in. What we are, what 
we are after here is a moving meditation. This means one where the act of motion puts us into the now and helps us to stop spinning. So I suppose g going to the gym and getting on a spinning bike perhaps doesn't count. <laughs> um, I used to do that. Not anymore. Um, 20 minutes a day is sufficient. The object is to stretch your mind more than your body. To stretch your mind more than your body. To stretch your mind more than your body. So there doesn't need to be an emphasis on fitness, although eventual fitness is likely is a likely result. Yeah, it's a perk. The and helps with the health of your. The goal is to connect to a world outside of us, to lose us, to lose the obsessive self-focus of self-exploration and simply just explore. One quickly notes that when the mind is focused on other, the self often comes into a far more accurate focus. That's quite good. That's, that's very good. I didn't actually, like, pick that up before. The goal is to connect to a world outside of us, to lose the obsessive self-focus of self-exploration and simply explore. Right, okay, okay. One quickly notes that when the mind is focused on other, the self often comes into a far more accurate focus. Oh, okay. Wow, ooh, that's interesting. Yes, yes. This is very much, okay, ooh, I like that. I like it, why? Because, I mean, this, I mean, if you want to learn more about that, I really do uh, recommend uh, checking out um, John Viveki. Uh, he's on YouTube, he made a 50-part YouTube series that, like, took his, um, it's, it, it, it made a lot of people aware of him and he's helped a lot of people and he's done other um, uh, series and things like that and uh, he talks about um, different meditations I think it's in his return to Socrates series in which he includes certain types of exercises one can do I do recommend the series in any case um, do start with the 50 part one I, you know it's it's just over 50 hours, but, like, it, it really is worth it. And you can you can do it within two weeks. You can do it stretched out further than that, you know. Um, but it is worth it. It is really, really worth it. Um, and then you can carry on through the rest of his work. Really, really great. There's also the John Vivekki Foundation that you can get a part of. And they do different things as well. So you, anyway, just go that route if you want to learn um, about, like, more about, you know, certain meditations uh, um, and techniques like that. Um, and about philosophy. Just really just go check that out. Okay. So I read this again because I, this is like, I really love this. The goal is to connect to a world outside of us, to lose the obsession of self-focus, of self-exploration, and simply explore. One quickly notes that when the mind is focused on other, the self often comes into a far more accurate focus. It's 6.30 a.m. when the great blue heron stirs from its resting place in the short grasses and rises above the river on huge rhythmic wings. The bird sees Jenny down below. Jenny, down below, sees the bird. The pumping of her legs carries her in an effortless floating stride. Her spirit soars up to the heron and chirps. Hello, good morning. Lovely, isn't it? At this time, in this place, they are kindred spirits. Both are wild and free and happy in their motion in the movement of the winds, the clouds, the trees. Oh. It is 4.30 p.m. when Jenny's boss looms into the doorway of her office. 
the new account is being picky and wants still more changes in her copy. Can she handle that? Yes, Jenny says. She can because she is still soaring on the glad energy of her morning's run. That heron, the steely blue of its flashing silver as it made that banking turn. Jenny would not call herself an athlete. She does not run in marathons. She does not run in cheery singles groups, although her distances have gradually increased and her thighs have gradually decreased. She does not run for fitness. Jenny runs for her soul, not her body. It is the fitness of her spirit that sets the tone of her days, changes their timber from strained to effortless. I run for perspective, says Jenny. When the client picks at her copy, Jenny detaches and soars above her frustration like the great blue heron. It is not that she doesn't care. It is that she has a new perspective, a bird's eye view on the place of her tribulations in the universe. I couldn't make, I mean, boom, that's like, sure. There's, I mean, there's a couple of other examples, but I, I really want to just stop it there. I mean, I can, oh, I see a little bit more. Okay, maybe I should, maybe I should just, just carry on. But that's, I just, you know, it's, that's beautiful. Okay, a quote by, well, from the Buddha. To keep the body in good health is a duty. Otherwise, we shall not be able to keep our mind in strong and clear. Uh, not the best one, <laughs> but anyway. <laughs> Eve Bippitz is a novelist and a swimmer, tall, blonde, and as generously curved as the freeway cloverleaf of her native Los Angeles. Bippitz swims in order to direct the traffic flow of her own overcrowded mind. Swimming, she says, is a wonderful sport for a writer. Every day she swims the aqu aquamarine oblong of her neighborhood pool. Her mind dives deep into itself, past the weeds and clutter of everyday concerns. What editor is late with, it, with a check? Why the typist persists in making so many errors and down to a quiet green pool of inspiration? That rhythmic, repetitive, repetitive, Action transfers the locus of the brain's energies from the logic to the artist hemisphere. It is there that inspiration bubbles up untrammeled by the constraints of logic. Shout out uh, Dr. Ian McGilchrist. Go, please go check out his work. Uh, he's even had uh, conversations with Dr. John Vareki. So there you go. Link, link, link. <laughs> Um, uh, it's great, uh, like Ian, in, uh, he's written, uh, okay, if I start talking about Ian McGillchrist, I mean, I'll carry on going, but, um, really, like, especially for imagination, and, um, uh, it's just, anyway, um, go check him out, it's I-A-I-N, and then McGilchrist, MC, um, G, Mc, uh, MC, G, I, L, Christ. Um, also, uh, they all, all, they have had a conversation with Karen on the meaning code. So there you got like three for, three for one. Um, and so definitely please. Like, give yourself, like, just the most amazing gift, and go, you can go now, to type in the meaning code, and subscribe, and start anyway, um, I really would appreciate that, okay, let's go, sorry,
Martha is a carpenter and a long distance bicyclist. Carpentry challenges her daily to find innovative solutions to construction problems, to untangle the intricacies of a complicated design situation requiring a simple answer to a complicated question. How can I build in workspace without using floor space when I'm done working? Or is there some kind of cabinet that could fit in this corner and around on this wall without seeming too modern for my furniture? Pedaling from her home in the suburbs to her job in the city, Martha encounters her answers to these questions in much the same way that the red-winged blackbird will suddenly take flight and cross her line of vision. Martha will be pedaling when levered doors will flash as a design solution. Pumping her bicycle rhythmically and repetitively, Martha also pumps the oh pumps the well of her creativity. It is my time to let my imagination roam and work out problems, Martha says. Solutions just come. Somehow, I am freed to free associate, and things begin to fall into place. The things that begin to fall into place are not merely work associated. When she cycles, Martha has a sense not only of her own motion, but also of the motion of God through the universe. Amen. God is good. She remembers riding alone on Route 22 in upstate New York. The sky was an azure bowl. The cornfields were green and gold. The ribbon of black asphalt that Martha rode seemed to her to head straight into the heart of God. Silence, a blue sky, a black ribbon on a highway, God and the wind. When I ride, especially at dusk and at early morning, I feel God. I am able to meditate more in motion than sitting still. Being alone, having the freedom to go wherever I want, Having the wind blow, riding alone in that wind, allows me to center myself. I feel God so closely that my spirit sings. Sure, that's beautiful. Um, here's a quote by Saraha. <laughs> I'm not sure who that is. Here in this body are the sacred rivers. Here are the sun and moon as well as all the pilgrimage places. I have not encountered another temple as blissful as my own body. Whew. Hopefully nearly done. <laughs> okay. Exercise teaches the rewards of process. It teaches the sense of satisfaction over small tasks well done. Jenny running extends herself and learns to tap into an unexpected inner resource. Martha would call that power of God, but whatever it answers to exercise seems to call it forth in other circumstances when we mistrust our personal strength. Rather than scotch a creative project when it frustrates us, we learn to move through the difficulty. Life is a series of hurdles, says Libby, a painter whose sport is horseback riding. I used to see it as a series of obstacles or roadblocks. Now they are hurdles and challenges. How well am I taking them? In the daily schooling of her horse, teaching her to think before she jumps, to pace herself properly, Libby has learned the same skills for her own life. Part of this learned creative patience has to do with connecting to a sense of universal creativity. Writing, my rational mind switches off, she says. I am reduced to feeling, to being a participant. When you ride through a field of grass and the little flecks of fluff from the wheat ears float around you, the feeling makes your heart sing. When a rooster tail of snow sparkles in the sun in your wake, that makes your heart sing. 
these moments of intense feeling have taught me to be aware of other moments in my life as they occur. When I feel that singing a feeling with a man and know that I have also felt it in the field of grass and a field of snow, then I know that is really my own capac capacity to feel that I am celebrating. Praise the Lord, these holy inspired people, my goodness, wow. Sure. Yo. Yo. It is not only the, the sense of a communion with nature that creates a singing in the heart. Um, <laughs> I want to, you okay. God, give me strength. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. <laughs> I'm going to hopefully can just get through this, um, finish up. Okay. It is not only the sense of a communion with nature that creates a singing in the heart. An endorphin-induced natural high is one of the byproducts of exercise itself. A runner may feel the same celebratory sense of well-being pounding in a dirty city street that Libby finds as she posts rhythmically on along a country trail. God is in his heaven, all rights with the world, is how Robert Browning categorized this feeling in his long narrative poem, Pippa Passes. It is no coincidence that Pippa experienced this feeling as she was walking. Not everyone could, can afford to ride a horse or even a 10-speed bike, bicycle. Many, excuse, sorry, many of us must rely on our feet for transportation and for recreation. Like Jenny, we can take up running, or we might make walking our sport. As an artist, walking offers the added benefit of sensory, sensory saturation. That's hashtag sensory saturation. Sensory, that's difficult to pronounce. <laughs> sensory saturation. Things do not whiz by. We really see them. In a sense... Insight follows from sight. We fill the well and later tap it more easily. That reminds me of one of the miracles and um, feel free to just delve and dive in, into the word and you can find that in the Bible. Uh, anyway, but um, where, where Jesus uh, meeting the, the woman at the well. Um, I also recommend checking out the series um, The Chosen. really depicts a lot of things um, in a beautiful way. Um, okay. Jerry is a confirmed city dweller. His country walks are limited to perusing window boxes and pocket gardens. Jerry has learned that in cities, people are the scenery. He has also learned to look up, not down, and to admire the frippery and friezies that often grace buildings that look quite well pedestrian at street level. As he roves the city canyons, Jerry has found a whole panoply of scenic attractions. There is a there is the orange marmalade cat that sits in the window above the window box with both pink and red geraniums. There is the copper church roof gone murky green that glistens silver in rainstorms. An ornately inlaid marble foyer can be glimpsed through the doors of one midtown office building. And on another block, someone has sunk a lucky horseshoe in the civic concrete. In the civic concrete. A miniature Statue of Liberty soars unexpectedly at, atop a dignified brick facade. Jerry feels at liberty himself, roaming the city streets on tireless feet. This courtyard, that cobbled walkway, Jerry gathers urban visual delights the same way his primordial ancestors, ancestors gathered this nut, that berry. 
and they gathered food. He gathers food for thought. That's the best, I think that's the best way of it. That's get laid out. That's very beautiful. Exercise, much maligned as mindless activity among certain intellectuals, turns out to be thought-provoking instead. As we said before, we learn by going where we have to go. Exercise is often the going that moves us from stagnation to inspiration, from problem to solution, from self-pity to self-respect. We do learn by going. We learn we are stronger than we thought. We learn to look, thing, look at things with a new perspective. We learn to solve our problems by tapping our own inner resources and listening for inspiration, not only from others, but from ourselves. Seemingly without effort, our answers come while we swim or stride or ride or run. By definition, this is one of the fruits of exercise. Exercise, the act of bringing into play or realizing in action. That's very good. I love that. That's stunning. <laughs> Let me just take a screenshot with my eyes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> ah. Let me go again. By definition, this is one of the fruits of exercise. Um, and this is from Webster's Ninth. I'm not sure if that's a book or whatever the case may be, but thank you to whatever it, or who it, that is. <laughs> This is for this quote, yeah? Exercise. The act of bringing into play or realizing in action. Cha-ching! And I think we're ending off here. <laughs> A quote by Theodore Rothke. God bless the roots. Body and soul are one. Ooh! Now that is beautiful. And I'm going to end it off recommending uh, reading through the entire visions but <laughs> which is actually not very long it, it actually takes less than 20 minutes but if you go into Ephesians 3 it, that's beautiful and yeah if if you really want to concentrate it which is um, to go uh, Ephesians uh, 3 verse 17 um, and it's uh, I'm not going to say the whole thing, but basically the the grip of that specific verse is to be rooted and grounded in love or in Christ. So that's why that's what I thought of now when it's like God bless the roots, and I mean roots and fruits. Um, and then I'm, now I'm thinking of different different things in the Bible, okay, I hear the call, like, I want to go and um, dive into a different place, <laughs> um, you know, so um, I feel like, you know, in an interesting, surprising way, I feel like I've been blessed, I hope that you also feel that, um, and God gets all the glory um, and honor and I think God is good thank you for being here thank you for breathing thank you for choosing to stick around if you're going through a difficult time please know that you are not the first, last, or only. And by that I mean that you can pray, but you can also reach out, and I want you to reach out, and that there is help available. I can't guarantee certain things, but if you can just be open to the possibility, possibility that you... You won't be you won't be going through what you're going through all the time forever, only 
solely by yourself alone and that whatever you're going through exempts you from anything good in life or from meeting that other person who who is the person that will love you for who you are right now and for who you are and perhaps you're hating yourself right now and not you're, you're working through some things and you start to get to the place where you are also standing in the place of loving who you are what I'm saying is that keep in mind that there's probably a, a couple of, but at least one other person that's going through something perhaps not identically the same to the every particle, but going through the same thing as you. Kind of thinking, I wish there was somebody else. And when, and just to relate to, just to listen to, just to feel like you belong here. You do. And, yeah, I think just continue choosing life and keep on keeping on. And giving up is not an op option. But I understand that feeling. And I'm just going to be light here. Just, but that feeling when you want to give up, well, that's the cue for the action of calling for help. Uh, contacting a friend, asking for help, reaching for help, texting for help, driving yourself to a place where people can help you. It is that, that's your action there. Okay, and um, you can do it. And, um, yeah. What can I say? Tomorrow is Monday. May that be a day that you wake up and say, yay, yay. <laughs> Another day, perhaps there's also joy in it today. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. It's a terrible rhyme. <laughs> but hopefully, in your own imagination, you can add some chimes. <laughs> but, yeah, just feel the intention. I'm going to stop now. I feel, I feel the awkwardness and I don't want to make you feel awkward. But um, yeah, anyway. <laughs> technology is limiting, but I do praise God for technology because not just, not because of this only, but because of a lot of things. A lot of things. And, and so like all glory to God. God is the power. He's in control. There, so yeah. Anyway. Ciao.